Harvard examination and where we are headed. My second impression was that while Bishop Byers is short in stature, he is a very compassionate, caring, knowledgeable person. Guys, if you have never met him, he is short. My son is short. He jokes about it. It's a little scary. He voices concern, though, about the division that is coming, has happened, and about his dismay, dismay that it has happened. But he is so very supportive of this decision also, even though it is not what he wants for the Methodist community as a whole. He understands and respects their decision. I thought his words were amazing and very comforting. They gave me hope that all is not lost and that there is room for all of us in God's kingdom. As much as the legislation had been done over Zoom, there were reports, and they can be found on the conference website, which Elizabeth and I can give you. I would urge you to go to that website and read them. They are very informative and may answer some of the questions you may have about our future. This year's conference was titled Morning to Dance and provided us with a, a, a substantial amount of mourning. Something I think many of us have been doing for the entire two years of quarantine, COVID, and the pandemic. But there was also hope and joy and dancing if only in our seats, as we sang wonderful songs of praise and recommitted ourselves to serving our Lord and our Savior. Several people spoke of their personal experiences during this time of dissension, and yet each of them also spoke of their hopes and dreams for the Methodist future, even though none of us know exactly what that future may hold. On Friday, we attended a session that was led by Reverend Ron Reverend Dr. Rob Bell from Minnesota, and boy, did he set a room on fire. He spoke of the fact that we have been dealing with so much conflict and tension that we have occasionally lost sight of what God is doing with and for us, of how he grew up as a settler, and how to teach his child how to speak. Think about that for a minute. That's a pretty big mountain to climb that we are all struggling to survive in this crazy world and how our human answers can be a contradiction to what God is telling us. He used 1 Samuel 30, verses 4 through 6, and it's just as an example of how David faced a huge conflict when the Amalekites had overrun Ziklag and burned it and taken everything, everyone who was there captive. David, in verse 5, went to the Lord and was strengthened by him. But David himself had to go through that conflict in verse 4 to get to verse 6, where God strengthened him and gave him the courage to move forward, to retrieve his people. David's container was not in good condition due to his grieving for his people, and God made his container strong again. That is what we all need to do on a daily basis and not let the pain of our everyday life become so great that we forget to ask God to strengthen us. We need to breathe, inhale and exhale slowly and frequently so that we can hear what God is saying to us. We need to recognize our ties, our physical, intellectual, emotional and spiritual parts and allow them to grow. We need to stretch and rewire our brain so that we don't miss what he is telling us. In other words, take care of your container every day so that you may hear what God is telling you or asking of you. What I said, Dr. Reverend Bell can and did set a room on fire. And he gave me many things to think about and take to God in my daily prayers. Try it. Maybe it will help you too. The ladies' event was held in the ballroom in the excuse me, in the afternoon, with 
We hear it is not reserved for speaking. He is a very dynamic speaker and is a life force when he's talking about bringing younger people into the congregation. He couldn't sit still. He embodies enthusiasm, and sometimes he waits for you to catch up with him. Mr. Scott told us about some of his experiences with college age people who are questioning their beliefs, faith, God, and how some of them have now given over their lives completely to Christ. He was especially good for me to hear because so often we only hear about the young people who have fallen away from their beliefs or their faith or they've never had any faith shown to them. It gave me hope for the next generation that they will find their way into the fold and hopefully join us in serving our Lord. It offers hope for all of us that what our ancestors, our parents, and even ourselves have worked for has not been in vain. They do hear us and want what we have to share, just in a different way. It is our job to continue to work with and hear what they have to tell us. We can still learn something new. It is with these young people that our church and our denomination will grow and prosper. We need to listen to them have some pretty cool ideas. And then the service of recognition, commissioning, and ordination. Bishop Barber's sermon was on lies and wild voices. And to be perfectly honest, I don't remember a lot of it. I do remember that he instructed each of us to go out into the world and speak about our God with wild and wise voices. Bishop Bard is very convincing. When he speaks about these kinds of things, he can make even the most hesitant of Christians become bold and daring when we speak of our God. As each person was presented for recognition, commissioning, or ordination, he spoke of their individual attributes and of the conviction that they would take the Lord's message to their new world with the blessing of our sovereign and of God. It was a seminal moment when we got to witness the ordination of our new pastor, Pastor Kayla. And to see the hands that were laid on her and the presentation of her shawl. To say that tears flowed is an understatement. This ceremony was a highlight of the conference for me. And I know that so many people felt the same way as I did as I watched and thank God for the privilege of being there. I love that she wore red shoes. <laughs> Saturday opened with a worship service with Reverend, Reverend Dr. Ron Bell preaching, and then we went into another plenary. Is that crazy word again? There was an explanation of Christ centered by our congregation, a trauma informed congregational ministry panel, corporate sessions, and a discussion of the church that has closed and, then it, and uh, those that have formed a new way of being. After lunch, the last plenary session informed us about Christ centered missions and ministry. All of the social, it also included the social justice legislation, budget, and the child hunger relief in Michigan. All of these discussions were informative and educational to a newbie who had no idea that we as a denomination are so involved with so many different ways to serve the Lord in our community and that many of those resources are available to us. The closing devotion was upbeat and enthusiastic, and there was dancing by a group of interpretive dancers. There was hope and joy and a feeling of renewal for myself personally and for the collective group as a whole. We were given a directive to go home and bring this positive attitude into our churches and to let you know that we are alive and well and ready to do the work that God has set before us, to continue to do His work on a daily basis, and welcome all who come through our doors with open hearts and minds. To say that I was overwhelmed is an understatement. It took me several months to be able to even put this all together. But the people I met left a deep and lasting impression on me. The chance to get to know Elizabeth on such a deep and spiritual level was exhilarating and a privilege. 
Thank you so very much for the opportunity to serve you as your delegate to this year's annual conference. And if you ever get asked to attend, please say yes. Believe me, you won't regret it. The many people I met, even briefly, were definitely God's people. And may this year be feel right at home and very welcome. The experience of finally finding out what plenary means and how it works is awesome. And the food ain't bad either.
We also passed the budget, which is reduced by 4% from the previous year. One way that we are reducing our budget to meet our new reality of reduced income is by reducing the number of districts from nine to seven. We approved the plan for that put together by the working group formed at the 2021 conference. One of our most emotional and at times contentious votes this year was on a resolution about gun violence. We heard many powerful and passionate statements, including Reverend Timothy and Chris Wojcik, standing to speak with a picture of their daughter, Holly, who was gunned down in 2004. Another young woman from our conference spoke about having to live in constant fear in her high school after the Oxford shooting. The resolution called for some specific action, including contacting legislative leaders regarding enhanced background checks, a reinstatement of the ban on assault weapons, and encouraging Michigan Methodists to participate in the End Gun Violence Now movement. There are likely different opinions on this legislation here in our church. What I think we can all agree on is that God calls upon us to reject violence and senseless killing. Let's each commit to doing all we can, where we are, with whatever tools we have available to us, to work towards a more peaceful nation. One where our children are not living in fear in their classrooms. A world where the news is not dominated every week or month by another tragic mass shooting event. I certainly don't have all the answers for how we achieve that, and to be honest, I don't think the conference does either. But I know that each of us has a part to play. We can start by praying for God's will here on earth as it is in heaven. Then we can take the next step of being the hands and feet of Christ, doing his will here on earth. Let's commit ourselves to helping make a world where people do not feel the need to turn to violence solve their problems. Other legislation we passed had to do with calling for the cancellation of federal student debt, advocating for a U.S. peace economy, affirming actions for the future of the U.S.C., encouraging Michigan Methodists to contact legislators to support immigrant driver's licenses and state IDs. We also passed the annual recommendation for clergy salaries and compensation and various resolutions from the Board of Pensions and Health Benefits. If anyone has questions about the legislation we passed, you'll find more details on our website page, and I'm happy to speak about it with anyone who's interested. The best part of this annual conference was seeing Pastor Kayla be ordained while Pastor Kathy and Pastor Julian stood alongside. I've shared that moment with you before. The second best part was the teaching session. Those are linked on our annual conference page on cloudbusting.org, and if you have not seen them, I really recommend watching the session from Reverend Ron Bell. I have now watched that a second time, and I was even more greatly blessed the second time. That was some teaching that I really needed and has influenced me deeply since conference ended. Really, really, don't miss it. I leave you with a question that was posed during one of the panel sessions. In three different panel sessions during conference, we heard from various clergy and lay people about different ministries within our Michigan Annual Conference. Because of the nature of our connectional relationship in the United Methodist Church and how our apportionments shape support one another, these stories are all of our stories. What was shared in the panel on bold and effective leaders, though, that I will share with you was this question. What is a seed of an idea you have for making our community a better place? As we begin to form our cooperative parish, and enter into a new era of ministry under Pastor Kayla's leadership. Let's dream about that together. Let's think about what seeds we can plant right here to improve Iowa, Michigan. I still believe that the church can be a powerful force for good in our community. I hope you do too. Let's figure out what those ideas are within this body of believers, and then let's get to work planting seeds here in Iowa and in Oakland.
there were spaces where I found myself caring for my own container, uh, even as he was delivering that message. And so I practiced caring for my container that morning professionally from my bed in my hotel room. And it was lovely. Uh, sometimes we need to do that. Uh, and so I, as we prepare ourselves for worship, not that that wasn't worship, it was, but I appreciate y'all hanging in there and know that we are going to continue in worship now. As we center ourselves, I invite you to hear these words. I mean, light the candle so we are connected. Those of you online, I hope you're still with us. Uh, and I would give you an invitation at this point in time that if you are visiting us online, put a V for visitor in the comments. If you're a frequent flyer, put FF. If you are a member, put an M. So we know that you are watching with us. We want to remember that you are indeed among us. Uh, and then if you happen to see this midweek, uh, hit a, put an R in there for replay as well. But as we center ourselves, as we all light our candle that represents God, Christ's Spirit, the Holy Spirit among us all, hear these words. As the ancients remind us, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Life is around us even in the memories of ghosts and loved ones long gone. Death is but one side of the coin of life. Hope is but the other side of the coin of despair. Unity is but the other side of, of the coin of division. Flip a coin. Choose your side, for life and hope await us on the other side. Good morning, church. Good morning. Please rise and join me in today's call to worship. You will find it on the screen. In the air, in flames. In the division and the despair, Christ is alive to challenge and invite us. In the shadows and in the sorrow, God walks alongside to lift us up. In this moment, we gather together to worship, to pray, to sing, and to lament. We gather on this blessed journey of life, death, 
Spirits are good. Um, she seemed to be happy with the progress that was made, but of course, bummed that she's not here this morning. So hold her and those that surround her in care and in your prayers, if you would. Uh, for Jan Coughlin, dear family friend who will be passing on the glory soon, that is from Carol Bookout. Uh, for from Noni, for God's continuing presence in our church and home. For Ron, uh, for his fight to regain help. And for Virginia Heller, from Virginia Heller, uh, for being healthy and blessed. She is thankful. Amen for that. Uh, and for uh, Michael Anderson and Wilbur Ernest, Ennis, Ennis, uh, gentlemen that are alone and just need prayer. Uh, so those are the prayers I would also offer up to you, the name Tasha Kindy, uh, somebody I have uh, taken classes with in the past, uh, somebody who I've been walking with on her cancer journey. I received a text at the beginning of worship, but she has gone on to glory as well after fighting uh, stage four colon, liver, lung cancer, I think all three things uh, in the last four and a half years. Uh, much longer than the doctors told her initially that she could fight. But uh, I lift those that surround her in community and who have been bedside with her as well uh, this morning to you all. For those and for those things that are lifted at home and that are lifted in our hearts but not aloud, we turn now to God for a word of prayer. Let us pray. God, we gather as your people and we offer the concerns of our life in the world and the world as we say god of mercy hear our prayer god we pray for the universal church may discord among denominations yield to unity and a common commitment to share the good news of christ we pray for the world prod us to engage in acts of mission and service that further the kingdom and honor the care that you have given us. We pray for those who hold authority in government, enable policymakers to enact justice, transforming places of violence and conflict into havens of respite and peace. We pray for all those in our community who are suffering the burden of illness, distress, or of any kind of pain. And we remember all those who have died and joined the great cloud of witnesses in heaven. Heavenly Creator, you inspire us to trust in the things we cannot see and to ground our faith in your promises to us. Give us the clarity of your vision and make us ready to serve you as we await your return. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who continues today to teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thank you. 
Another piece from the hand of Charles Wesley. Hear these words as we center ourselves for these moments in worship. Come, divine interpreter, bring the eyes thy book to read, ears the mystic words to hear, words which did from thee proceed, words that endless bliss impart. Keep in an obedient heart. All who read or hear are blessed, and by plain commands we do. Of thy kingdom here possessed, thee we shall in glory view. When thou comest on earth to abide, great triumphant at thy side. May it be so. Amen. Amen. The gospel lesson today, I don't know if you caught it, but it was kind of a hold on to your seats moment, if I might say that. I think we all kind of looked around the table at one another on Monday and said, how are we going to deal with this? <laughs> Hence why you had a couple of different pieces uh, to prepare you for this, because this could be a much longer sermon to digest that a little bit more. And so I endeavor to do my best in this space. There's probably far more that could be said and probably better to be done in Bible study. But this is the gift of preaching the lectionary. You all know what the lectionary is? It's a three-year cycle where we rotate through different scriptures of the, the, both the New Testament, Old Testament, and we usually get an option of a, you always have an option of a gospel text and psalms to go along with it. It's a beautiful rhythm. It's generally how I tend to preach. Not that you will get proper sermons that veer off that course from time to time, but it's a good rhythm to get the full scope of scripture in the gospel. But this is, this gospel passage is not one where we encounter the happy, clappy Jesus that we all hope for on Sunday mornings, right? Right? This is a very uncomfortable passage to read and to receive. This is a Jesus that came to bring division. Could this be the same Jesus that is the Prince of Peace? Did, really, did Jesus really come to divide my family, our family? This passage is a reminder that Jesus came into the world to flip the world upside down from the way that it had been. <coughs> the message he brings upsets the order that exists in the world and still calls us to account today. In fact, it's still an unsettling message, as we've all acknowledged, right? A little uncomfortable. And it jars us a little harder in the midst of these seasons that we have been in with the amount of divisiveness that we face in each of our daily lives from a multitude of angles. From the announcement of Jesus is coming into the world until he departs, we hear about how he came to be about peace to bring about peace. For us to understand this passage, we must have eyes of faith to seek deeper meaning behind what he is really seeing and saying, I mean, perhaps that was a slip that was necessary, eyes of faith. 
This passage is not giving us permission to go start fighting with one another. It is not. That's not what this is about. It's not here to justify the conflicts and the tensions that exist that we find ourselves in. And it's, this is not the narrative of the loving God, of loving God and loving neighbor that we are called to as the greatest commandment. It's here to place an urgency in the lives of the people who are followers and bystanders to the ministry of Jesus. We too must pay attention to claim our faith and look to the world with eyes of faith as we are diligent in our own lives to be ready for God's kingdom. You see, in this passage, Jesus is awarding his audience that the time will come when the status quo will indeed be flipped on its head. The family systems in order that maintain the society will be disrupted. The world he entered into, the world he is preaching to, is not the way that it should be. We could say that it still is not the way that it should be. They have not fully heard or understood what he's been preaching about. And so to remind you, we're in Luke 12. Jesus is not in the early days of his ministry. In fact, he knows he is turning towards Jerusalem. He is already turned towards Jerusalem to make his journey there. The week to travel, the week of, that we celebrate as Holy Week, to endure the pain and suffering on the cross when his friends leave his side. And so it's a reminder to us that we need to frame all of that in scripture with how he is framing that to his audience, this message. It's easy for us in a post-Easter season to get lost in that rhythm sometimes, especially because we haven't preached the gospel in a couple of weeks. So know that he is set towards Jerusalem, making his way there, nearing the end of his ministry. And spoiler alert, because the next several passages in the weeks ahead are a little challenging. So this one just kind of opens the door for that, for us to consider having eyes of faith and what that really means as disciples, as followers of Jesus Christ. This passage would have been set before Holy Week, as I said, as he is making the way to the cross, and tensions are rising because the leaders are not happy. People are being divided, claiming allegiances either to him or to they're digging into their social norms, trying to be quiet so they don't get the attention brought toward them to be oppressed further. Jesus is challenging his listeners to have eyes of faith. The time is coming when their faith in their teacher should outshine their faith in institutions. Jesus gives his listeners a reminder that faith in God challenges the status quo. The family structure laid out here was the bedrock of society in biblical times. Each of those relationships played a key role in society to ensure the success of the family according to the structure within that community. And again, as I said, this, this knowing that Jesus is here to bring division is not an invitation to begin fighting with one another or justify any form of fighting or war or divisions that already exist or will exist. The world is sticky and divisive and plain, a painful place at times because we're human. We're imperfect, trying to make sense of what God puts before us with our limited knowledge of the expanse of God that we gather in this space, in person and online, to worship. The very nature of Jesus' presence and message upsets the status quo of the biblical world. Some are experiencing liberation and some are held in oppression by the social norms that exist. In order to get to the peace that Jesus comes to bring, sometimes conflict must happen. Jesus is warning his audience that the time will come in the not-too-distant future where households will be divided over these such matters. 
What is the kingdom of God? Where is the kingdom of God? They will be forced to wrestle with their allegiances. There will be division among the disciples in the days to come as the events of Jesus' death and resurrection unfold. Will they stay? Will they go? Will they be awake? Will they fall asleep? The second scripture passage we heard today speaks of the great cloud of witnesses, the beautiful gift of our tradition that we celebrate in our creed. We celebrate when we gather at the communion table, the great communion of saints that connects us to the people, to all the people who have gone before us. This cloud of witnesses contains people who have shown us a way in our own spiritual journeys, who have conquered divisions, who have wrestled with what it means to be faithful witnesses to God's call, command, and promises. They have demonstrated what it means to persevere even when they didn't see the results that they had hoped for in their lifetime. They persevered even when things didn't make sense, keeping their eyes on God, their trust in God, not in humans, not in some man-made institution. So how does that pair with the theme of the day? Faith with eyes to see? Remember last week when I said we must begin with the end in mind, and that end is the kingdom of God? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. The kingdom of God is not fully realized yet. Even though Jesus said the kingdom of God is among us, it takes eyes of faith to see God's kingdom all around us. We must be prepared and be diligent in our daily lives to continue the work that God began through Jesus' ministry on earth. It takes deep faith and understanding of God's justice, peace, and love to see the unseen, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. It takes acts of courage from each of us, stepping outside of what me, might be a social norm within our family, our church, to bring about God's kingdom on earth. Faith is active and demanding. This is not a passive thing that we have, that we participate in. It can lead to suffering and pain when we are led to difficult, different decisions than our friends and family. Many of us know that all too well. Faith challenges us to let go of our human understandings and cling to things that are unseen. Faith trusts that even when we may not see the end of our story, we know that God is with us each step of the way. And God is working all things together for the good, even if good isn't what we desire in our hardest of hearts, isn't what we would have it be. We know through the testimony of the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews, that God is with them, God was with them, as God is with each of our pillars of faith in our own lives, just as God is with each of us in this moment. Friends, as you go about your week, may you trust wholeheartedly in the God of our great cloud of witnesses. May you open your eyes, may you see with eyes of faith, that allow you to have glimpses of God's kingdom. Amen. Amen. Now I invite you to this time of reflection. Sit tight, stand, sing, hum, whistle, whatever it means for you to connect. But hear oceans, where feet may fail, a familiar hymn, as our choir has sung. Oh,
So hang with me just a little bit longer, because if you're not familiar with how the church looks today, it looks a little different. And if you don't know, we had VBS this past week. And I would like to take some time to show you wonderful pictures that Mr. Dave Bauer took for us. Put to a song that we learned this past week, Nothing is Impossible, and I'll reflect on that later. But enjoy the video.
And don't worry, I didn't harass Dave about those pictures. <laughs> I will actually warned him ahead of time, right, Dave? Yes. Okay. That's all right. So, let me give you my insights on what it meant to see a very faithful thing go before my eyes. BBS has come and gone. It's time for rest and more rest. <laughs> and a little bit more after that. But also reflection. And my main reflection was that this was a very faith-filled BBS. We looked at four miracles that Jesus did. And we noted that it takes faith to see a miracle and believe that God did those miracles. With this being my first year as a VBS director, I was struggling to keep that faith that God was going to make this VBS into what it needed to be and was believing that a miracle was going to be needed to survive it. But yet, I saw what it meant to have faith this past week. On day one, we looked at the story of Jesus turning water into wine. And we learned that God will be there to help us with our needs, big and small, at all times. Talk about the Bible coming to life before me. I needed to remember that God was always with this church and me during this VBS process. That it didn't need to be perfect, no matter how badly I wanted it to be. Or this big show, it just needed to be. I added some self-induced pressure to make sure that it was going to be perfect because this was our first in-person VBS in three years. And the story was a simple ask from Mary to say, go and help them get more wine that led Jesus to create the miracle. It was a simple ask from God to say, go and create this VBS. Day two, we looked at Peter walking on water. and We learned that God is always with us when we're emotional. Big or small, positive or negative, we remembered that God will always be with us at all times. So after day one, you would have thought my anxieties would go down. No. I think any of the volunteers could tell you that. They were still there. Those anxieties caused confidence, sh confidence shifts and doubting questions that made me believe one of two questions. Am I forgetting something? And do I know what I'm doing? And with all those anxieties, I remember that God was with me. With God's guidance, wisdom, and energy, VBS was sought to the very end. Day three, we learned the story of Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection. We learned that through Jesus, we were guaranteed eternal life. That God had the power to bring the things back to life, breaking the cycle of how we know things to be on earth. The life that this VBS brought was, a, was astounding, at least. From the kids enjoying the music, more so than I thought, to the engagement in the questions, the crafts, the stories, the energy that was used while playing games, it was insane. I couldn't help walking away from each day of EBS so far feeling motivated. Tired, but motivated. On the final day, we looked at the story of Paul's conversion. We talked about how Paul was constantly moving and sharing the gospel with everyone. This was the perfect story to close our VBS with. At dinner, the, the VBS celebration dinner, I saw church members talking to the families and building relationships. I saw the love of Christ being reflected in the conversations, the laughs, and the memories that were being made. We were the light of Christ shown into all who were there. It was a long four days. It was tiring physically, mentally, emotionally, yet, if you asked me today if I would do it all over again, I would say yes. Huh? Would. would, yeah. I would say yes, as long as you guys give me enough recovery time. <laughs> but in all seriousness, this year's VBS reminded me that I needed to have faith in what God will do when I might not know how to do it. And I will do what God's called me to do and let God handle the rest. And at the same time, that table right there is the results of a faith-filled VBS mission project. Those are donations we've collected in four days, almost. And I encourage you to continue donating because the faith that went into this project was big and it's already led to this. We have two more weeks of collecting and it can only get bigger from there. 
At the same time, I'd like the ushers to come forward for a quick second. Because as part of my job, there's always public embarrassment. <laughs> so we have to share our appreciation for those that helped. So if those that are here that helped, stand where you are in your pew. If you can't stand, put your hands up. Steve and Denny will walk around. You get one notebook and one pen as my appreciation. Very small appreciation, but my appreciation of saying thank you. So stand. And as I do that, church, I want you to take a moment <laughs> to acknowledge Mark. I'm not done yet. <laughs> because he asked me if he wanted if I wanted to do this part or if, if I wanted him to do it. And and here's the thing. Folks, if you've never led a vacation Bible school before, I don't think you can ever fathom the amount of details that go into it. And those of you who have helped, you know a piece of it, but not the whole piece. And over and over and over again this week, I was reminded of the gift that we have in Mark being on staff. And I'll say with Corey on staff too, because even during the day they were running around, they were troubleshooting, things that you don't often see in conversations where he was pulling aside to have some chit chat with me throughout the night and even to the wonderful blessing of a phone call when I was caring for my container on Wednesday night on my couch with a bag of ice on my knee just vegging after a two hour nap, uh, where he called and the kids shouted, we miss you or something. I don't even remember what you said. It might've just been hi. I think it was hi. Which was a gift. Friends, we have a blessing in this church to be a blessing in this community. You are a part of that through supporting his ministry here, through supporting the gifts that you have brought for this collection, this is just the beginning of this collection. I know that we can grow this a little bit more, if not a whole heck of a lot more. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for sending and supporting the children and this young man in the ministry that he does in this church. Thank you, thank you, thank you. From the bottom of my VBS heart and years of making a fool out of myself on stage, <laughs> in the multitude of ways when you never know what you're doing. I don't know if we ever know, uh, to the, I don't know who the oldest person in the room is right now to ask, do you ever know? We never know. Our job is to continue to show up and be faithful and respond to the best that we can with eyes of faith. Thank you for being eyes of faith and seeing those seeds through. Thank you, Mark. It's an honor to serve alongside of you. Well, I don't know if I could say much more than that. But from Corey and Les doing music, Hope leading the missions, Paul Staley and Sarah Steele, or yes, doing games, Sue Hilgris, Anna Fillin with Diane Weaver doing story, Sally Van Horn, Chris Frazier doing crafts, myself and Linda Daniels doing science, Diane and Steve doing some decorating. From Pat Walker, Mavis Miller in Virginia at registration, Nancy Frazier, Judy Lewis, and Barb Nickerson at Snacks, Sue Boyce and Les Randall at running the dinner for everybody, and Nola, Elizabeth, Carol, and Ron, <laughs> and, and Noni for helping out with group leaders, above everybody else to help out <laughs> with donations, prayers, <laughs> and everything else. I should have been playing with him. Thank you. <laughs> I say we didn't get Charles Wesley, but we got Snowy the Owl at Snowy the same the time. <laughs> so from the bottom of my heart, above everything, along with everything, and for Dave for coming up Monday and Tuesday to take pictures. If I forgot anybody, forgive me. It's still a VBS brain that I'm working with. Um, thank you. And now please rise for a closing hymn. Oh, no. no we still have I'm to say the ahead. sing the I'm doxology ahead. yet. I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> We're I'm getting jumping there. Ahead. We're almost there, friends. I know I'm it has been ahead. a long service. Thank you for hanging in. I remind you to be mindful of the abundance that we have received in Christ as we pause to hold space 
for offering ourselves, our gifts, our time, and our talent to the world for the ministry of Christ. Would you rise and sing the doxology, please? trust, O God, in your provision and loving kindness. Use these gifts in our lives that we might bear your fruit with praise and thanksgiving. We ask this in the confidence of your mercy and love. Amen. Please remain standing for number 196. Yes, another Christmas song, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Christ, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, grant you the perseverance and courage to follow him in all justice, righteousness, and peace. Go in peace and see God's kingdom through eyes of faith. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
with the Ministerial Association here in Clio to hand out school supplies among a variety of other activities. We do need school supplies. Any and all essentials will be helpful. Bring them to the church no later than Tuesday by noon so that we can uh, see what we have and uh, pick up anything else that's needed. We are also in need of volunteers. People to help with the setup and people to help with the distribution. The setup will be from 4 to 6 30. The distribution will be from 6 30 to 8 30. If you're able to help on either or both of those time frames, go to Corey's office. Please sign up if you're interested. If you have any questions, on Wednesday, we are having our final Summer Vibe. We'll be doing a laser tag night. Summer Vibe, the laser tag night, is open for all you 5th to 12th grade. It is a free community event. We will set up the fellowship hall and the fireplace room into this very awesome arena. Great sellings and a summer celebration. Food will be provided. If you have any questions, see me. Don't forget about our cooperative parish fun day happening on August 24th down at Clio Park from 4.30 to 7. There will be a sign up sheet available soon for any and all people who are willing to help out with donating food supplies, donating your time, and just being there to help connect Bethany UMC and Otisville UMC together as our cooperative parish. If you have any questions, see any of the members of the bridge team. On August 28th, we will be doing our blessing of the backpacks. This is a time where we invite all of our students to bring their backpacks to church with them, and they will receive a tag that says, you got this, and that reminder is one that will be carried with them on their backpacks to let them know that God and this church body supports them in any and all ways. As we mentioned every week, prayer cards will be collected during the first hymn. Make sure to write legibly and mark on the box or mark on the card whether it is for Pastor Kayla to share aloud or if it is just for Pastor Kayla's information only. And also, if you have your offering, don't forget to drop it off at the podium in the narthex by the glass doors if you were unable to come up during sundays to drop your offering off you can mail it into the church or drop them off during any and all office hours and now i turn the 